Hey, this is Pastor Brian from Launch Point Church, and uh, I hope that this finds you finding peace and not being overly anxious in these moments. I know it can be a little, uh, it can produce some anxiety when we're in the middle of this coronavirus uh, spread and trying to respond to that in all kinds of areas. And so uh, Friday we were hit pretty hard with some news that the county was closing all of its facilities until the end of April, which included ours at Walter Butler Community Center where we meet. And uh, so we had to remove all our things on Saturday and, and try to figure out what else to do. And with the short time frame that we had, we decided we would try this uh, video thing. It's not ideal. It might feel a bit awkward, even more for me than you as you're watching it. But uh, we wanted to pull it off anyway and think fast and kind of make something work. So uh, there's no, no, no way of knowing what is really happening next. It seems like every day something new happens, something new something new happens that's bigger and more broad and in its spectrum on how things are being responded to. And so we're kind of just playing it out as we go and uh, trying to make the best decisions to affect us all in the best kind of way so that we can, uh, we can be the church. We're still the church, and no matter if we're meeting somewhere or meeting remotely, and we want to be able to encourage you and uh, pray for you and do all the things we do as a church even during these kind of times. So we're just going to have to adjust a little bit and let us know how we can help you along the way. So uh, this doesn't have to be limiting to us that we're doing it this way. It feels limiting, but we can still see it as a great opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Uh, you can be praying for and with others. Just this um, uh, a few nights ago, maybe Thursday night, it was actually a friend of mine and I went out on Wednesday night. Uh, one of these nights this week, went out to the mall in Merritt Island and walked through and just shared the gospel and prayed for a few people along the way. And it was, it was just a good reminder of what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So in the midst of this, this can still be an opportunity when life is out of its normal to be able to share with others around you, pray for others, and uh, be a blessing to people. You can pray for and with others and let them know you're praying for them if you don't do it right away. And uh, you can see what people might need and how you can help. And, and in Christian love, we can have an effect as well. I'm going to be emailing those who put their info in for the church directory. Uh, we're going to be emailing you uh, so that you can contact others. We're going we're gonna to email the phone numbers and emails and names of those who wanted to have theirs published. And so you can, I know you're probably like, oh, I wanted to call so-and-so. I just don't know their, their number and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to get that to you pretty quick. So you can be calling and emailing and, and encouraging one another and seeing how you can help while we're kind of in this downtime. And then I'm considering, I know it, let me know if it'd be a help to you, but I'm considering doing kind of another thing like this, like an online Bible study that you can do at home. And uh, hopefully that would encourage you spiritually too. Let me know about that. My family is scheduled to be in Georgia next Sunday for a wedding for some very close family friends. And uh, we'll see if that goes or not. I've already seen just Saturday night that uh, from the federal government, they're talking about a restriction on even domestic travel between states. And so that would be a problem since uh, I'd have to go to Georgia to do that. But uh, I'm always going to be available by phone and email just the same. So you can still do that. If you're on Facebook watching this, I want to encourage you to comment in the section below this video so that uh, we can have some conversation. It's, it's hard to feel like we're interacting if I'm just talking and you're just watching. So uh, let us know you're here watching this and comment to each other about the service and, and uh, put some prayer requests on there if you want. And then um, also there's going to be some notes along the way in my sermon on the, on the video that comes right after this short intro here. And uh, let's pray and we'll get started in the scriptures together. God, thank you for your love and your mercy, especially in difficult times like this when we're not sure what's going to happen or where we're going next and all those kind of things. I pray that you remind us to keep our eyes on you, remind us that you are God, no matter what our circumstances look like, you don't change. And so we look to you today that you would impart to us some of your wisdom and your grace and we are also looking to you today that we might bring ourselves in service to you, maybe in a different way because we're not in church together, but God, we want to bring ourselves in service to you today. And we ask that you would show us how we can not only connect with you, but connect with someone else in these days to be able to be a blessing. 
In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we are, have been uh, talking about soul fire, the fire inside of us that when God is with us and God is using us and he's working in us, it, uh, it causes us to, to burn with this compelling to, uh, to be everything he has for us to be and to do everything he has for us to do. And uh, we've talked already about his presence with us and the purity that he brings to our hearts and to our lives because of his Holy Spirit in our lives. And today we're going to be talking about the power of his presence, the power that we get. It's, it's the ability to go beyond ourselves in, uh, in serving him. I mean, I, I'm only, I can only do so many things. I can only do those things in so many ways. But in serving in God's kingdom, so many other things I'm, we, we are called upon to do that's beyond us. Things that I might say, well, I can't do that, or I'm not gifted enough, or I'm not, I'm not qualified. And uh, what he says is, hey, come on, follow me, surrender to me, and I will give you the power of the Holy Spirit to do whatever needs to be done for his kingdom and for his mission. So this is about going beyond ourselves, and we're going to see it from a very familiar passage of Scripture. Um, First, just to be reminded, um, are you not intrigued when you read through the scriptures and you see the things that these apostles did, the 12 disciples that became apostles but got sent out to, uh, to minister or like the apostle Paul, are you not intrigued at all at the kind of supernatural things that happened around them? I am. When I read that, I'm like, why not today, God? Why not me? Why, why not for me to be able to serve you in that same capacity? And I believe he wants to. I believe he wants to. And so uh, it may not be every moment and every day or whatever, but and it won't be for our glory and for our purposes. It'll be for his glory and his purposes and his mission. So why not? And that's, that's usually what I ask when I see these kind of things. Uh, Jesus said in the book of John, so many times he said, uh, uh, these things that I'm saying, I'm telling you what I hear my father saying. And I'm doing these things that I see my father doing. And so those are indications that by the power of the spirit, he's being guided to serve Jesus, serve God, sorry, Jesus is serving God when he's on, on earth, especially that we can see. He's serving God in the power that God has given. He's being guided into the things that he should be doing and he's in the things that he should be saying. And then the apostle Paul travels all over and he's speaking into communities and he's healing people and the Holy Spirit is directing his path. And so not just some kind of supernatural flare up so that we can get some attention, but actual guidance from the Holy Spirit in our lives to be able to serve. So this is about the soul fire and the power that comes with that. And so here's this familiar passage in Acts chapter two that, that you've probably been read to so many times in church in your lifetimes, if not, um, we're going we're gonna to check it out again today. If you haven't heard it, then it's going to be fairly new and probably pretty exciting to you to think about. This is after Jesus had ascended into heaven after he was resurrected. And, uh, and he told the disciples to go and pray, wait in the city and pray, waiting for the promise of God, the sent one, the one that would come alongside them, the Holy Spirit, to empower them. And he told them, I will give you power. The power will come on you when the Holy Spirit comes. And then there will be his witnesses around the world, including where they lived. And so this, this power is very interesting. It's kind of, it's what we're looking for, right? To be able to serve God with this great power. So I'm going to read this out of Acts chapter 2, first four Gospels uh, into the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then Acts is right following that. And we're looking at chapter 2. And so this, this happens at the day of Pentecost. It's an actual Jewish feast. And um, it comes 50 days, I believe it's 50 days after um, Passover. So Penta means five, and so it's multiples of five, Pentecost. And, uh, and I grew up thinking that Pentecost, this is why it's called Pentecost, because what happened here, when actually it's a Jewish feast called Pentecost, and uh, they were doing what they were supposed to be doing. So at, at that, in those days, uh, he tells them to go and pray, and this is what happens. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit 
and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Verse 5, Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven because of Pentecost. They had come back for the Feast of Pentecost. And so all these people are there of different language, in fact. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, there's always those kind of people, made fun of them and said, they've had too much wine. And that's why they're able to speak in other languages. That's kind of an interesting thought. Anyway, verse 14, so then Peter stood up with the 11, the other, the other uh, disciples there, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, this great sermon that Peter preaches here. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so now he begins to uh, remind them about the, the prophet Joel from the Old, Tes Old Testament. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs below. On the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I wanted to stop there because it's such a long chapter, but you can't because there's so much more that comes with it. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan to, and the foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body will also rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead you will not let your holy one see decay you have made known to me the paths of life you fill me with joy in your presence fellow Israelites I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day but he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him and on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised Jesus to life. He has raised Jesus to life. And we are witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. That's why I didn't want to leave it there. We have received what was promised. I'm sorry, he had received what was promised from the Father, the Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. Jesus is pouring out what you now see and hear, this Holy Spirit. He goes on to say some other things about the crucifixion of Christ and tells him to repent and... Um, it, that his promise is for everybody 
So they needed to save themselves. In the very end, they were pressing and they said, what must we do to be saved? And many, many, many people came to Christ that day because the power of the Holy Spirit was poured out on these guys and they began to speak in language that they did not know. And it says they were speaking the wonders of God. That's what the people were hearing. People were drawn to. So it's about the power of the Spirit in us to go beyond ourselves to do what God has for us to do. So let's look at, there's three things right now here. Number one is the right place and time. The right place and time. And we might think, wow, the only time and place that the Holy Spirit was poured out was on that day of Pentecost. And that's not what I'm trying to say. But there is a right place and a time. In this it says, hey, the day has come. Pentecost had come, the actual day of Pentecost. And so there was Jews from all over the known world there celebrating that. They were all there at the right place at the right time. And it says he will baptize you. John the Baptist said he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And here they are being obedient to be in this place just as Jesus told them to be. So their obedience, the promises like it was read in Joel, all kinds of things coming together. And at the right place and time, this is there. But if we're talking about them and their connection with God and, and the Holy Spirit, they were obedient to Christ. They had put, their hearts were so in tune with him and they so wanted this promise that God would send that they were, they were there at the right place and the right time. It had to do with the environment of their heart uh, more than anything because God had already said this will happen to those whose heart is in the right spot. So that's what they do. Something to think about is there's an atmosphere, there's an atmosphere in which the Holy Spirit works best. Now, I know that God's Spirit can go anywhere in this earth and speak to anyone he wants to be drawing us. We were drawn to God by his Holy Spirit anyway. He is doing that. We're talking about this baptism or this filling with his Holy Spirit, the pouring out of his Holy Spirit so that we can do beyond our own selves in serving God, this power of this soul fire. And so if there is an atmosphere, if there is a place in which we can get our hearts into that he will speak to us, that I want to go there, don't you? Why would I want to avoid the very place where God's spirit is acting the most? I want to be there. So there's this atmosphere where the Holy Spirit works the best. And here it is. It's where people's hearts are obedient to Christ. I'm not just kind of coming in and out and talking about Jesus or singing about Jesus. I'm, my heart, my heart it's obedient to Christ. I want to live to follow Christ. So what he says, remember I, I mentioned before how Jesus said in the, in the book of John, the things I hear my father saying, I say. And the things I see my father doing, I'm doing. That's an obedient heart. And we want to have an obedient heart to Christ, just like he had to, to the father. And so that's part of where the spirit's working. There's also a thing here, but where there's, there's a unity for the mission of God. These guys, they wanted Jesus to fulfill, to fulfill his mission in them. They wanted to be the ones to fulfill the mission. And so that's why they're obedient, because they want that. And so on their hearts, on their minds, is what did Jesus want us to do? Where did Jesus want us to be? What did he want us to say? And they were doing that together. There's great power in unity. There's so many things that happen when there's a unity of, of believers on mission, wanting to follow Christ, wanting to be obedient. And then another one is about where people hunger for God to work in them. I'm hungering for God to work in me. When I look at my own self, I see so many things I'd love for God to change. And so I'm hungering for God to make me better and make me more. Enough so that I will do what's needed to be done to overcome those things. I'm hungering for him to fill me with his righteousness. And I'm hungering to live in his righteousness. So there's a hunger in God's people to work in them, but not just in them. Not just inside of them, but also through them, through us. There's a hunger for God to use us to minister to other people. So it's not just about us. God's kingdom was never just about our insides. God's kingdom was about what happens on the inside of us so that we can go out and be what he wants us to be for others. If you think about Jesus, was it just about him coming to earth so he could be a righteous person and then die and then go to heaven? No, he was mingling about all kinds of people. He was mingling about the people that the religious leaders didn't want anything to do with. 
It was about what God was doing through him as much as what God was doing in him. It's not about the exact place and time. It's about the right place in our hearts and in our minds. So number two is this, this fire within us. The fire within us. In this whole thing, the Holy Spirit shows up and causes just a scene, right? The wind, it sounds it sound like a mighty rushing wind blowing in. And this isn't the first time this kind of thing happened. It happened when they were dedicating the Old Testament temple. It happens um, with, with Abraham when God is making a covenant with him. It happens in a multitude of places. So this, this wind, and then it says this fire comes down and it like separates and goes onto the top of each one of them. It's quite a picture. It's quite a picture. Then they begin speaking in all these languages, the wonders of God, these languages that they didn't even know. They're causing a scene. So the Holy Spirit is this fire within us is causing this thing to happen. And uh, it's, it's quite a scene. Because it was Passover again, all these Jews from the known world were there. They wouldn't be there except because to celebrate something Jewish. And so they showed up to be there uh, at the Passover time. It was one of the times they, that they needed to be in Jerusalem. So they go up and they show that they hear all this commotion. They hear God's, the wonders of God being spoken of in their language because the fire was within these guys. The Holy Spirit was coming inside of them, baptizing them as it were and filling them on the inside. And they begin to do what the Holy Spirit wants them to do and it's affecting people all the way around them. The presence of God within them, his Holy Spirit within them, was causing them to go beyond themselves, doing something bigger than they could have dreamed because they were surrendered to him, way bigger than they had dreamed of. So his power in us becomes evident. It becomes evident, not because I say it is, that his power is there, but when I have this surrendered life to Christ, I'm living obediently and we're eager for him to use us, then the fire within comes and becomes very evident. And so that's where we want it to be. We want it to be seen. It's a power to be and to do. It's both. And, and some might say, well, it's a power to make us pure. And we love that. We want that. It's what, it's what the Spirit is doing in us. He's purifying us from these desires to, to go against God and to do the wrong thing. He's purifying us from this nature inside of us that has always wanted to be selfish and build our own kingdom instead of God's kingdom. It's purifying that all out of us. And so that's what he's doing. So this is about being, but it's also about doing. It's not just about one or the other. It's about both. So number three is it's the power to be and to do. I love in verse four when it describes them as being filled with the Holy Spirit. I think there's a couple, it reminds me of a couple places in my life in which, uh, like I remember on our wedding day, Don was, Don was standing at the altar area from or the stage area from where we were and I was, I came, I'm sorry, I was standing down there. It's, uh, got it all mixed up. I think I was so emotional I kind of forgot the details. I was standing by the stage area and she came walking in. And in those moments, especially in those moments, my, my whole, I was just consumed with what was happening with her. That it was, she was coming to me and this, what all of this meant. I was being filled with love and I was being filled with devotion. I was being filled with what it meant for us to be married. And uh, you, you probably experienced something very close to that at your wedding, I hope. And, uh, and so is that, I remember, I remember other times when our children were being born and I got to hold them for the first time. I was just filled with this, with this emotion for this little person that, that God has given to us. And at the moment, it was all about them and what was happening, but it was filling me at the same time. And I, I, get, I get proud sometimes, even in these days, a lot of times in these days, when I see my kids uh, reaching new milestones in life, crossing thresholds, when when our daughter and son-in-law told us that she was going to have a baby, I got just filled with this thing of what it meant for them to be in that position as well as for us to be in that position, to be grandparents. All of that stuff put together, just filled with him. And so the idea of them being filled with this Holy Spirit was going to change the way they thought. It was going to change the way they lived. It was going to change their perspective. It was going to change everything that was going on in their lives. And that's what we want as well. It means that God was going to be doing something in them which was going to cause them to do something. It's caused them to be who they were and it was going to cause them to do something else. What were they being? They were being the children of God as he intended. 
They were being disciples as God had intended, as Jesus had taught them. It meant that they were, in that relationship was the being. They were God's children following after him, connected to him, and all the joy that that brings and all the peace that that brings. He was bringing them into being in his family, in his kingdom. But what was that going to lead them to do? Because they're the children of God, their mindset transforms and they begin to look at things differently. They begin to look at the world differently and their purpose differently and people around them differently. All kinds of stuff begins to change because now we have the mind of Christ. And that's what was going on with them. They had a mind of God. The Holy Spirit was in there. It was filling them. And so it began to change the way they thought and, the, and understanding of who they were and changing what they were going to do even. We are not Jesus, and I know that full well. But when the Holy Spirit is present in us, changing our desires and our actions, we begin to look and act like Jesus because that's what he's doing inside of us. So here, here's the deal. How in the world do we get that? How in the world do we get this filling of the Spirit for ourselves, so that not just for us, but so that we can live for God wholeheartedly in everything that he wants us to do. Here's one of the things. Our hearts and minds need to be so entangled with God's heart and mind that we can sense what he's thinking. You know what it's like when you're really close with somebody? It might be a parent, it might be a child, it might be your spouse, it might be people you've worked with all your life, and you just know what they're thinking, you know what the next move is that they're going to make. You can almost finish their sentence. It's that we get so entangled with God and understanding who he is and, and our relationship with the Spirit in us that, uh, that we begin to think in the same terms. And how does that come? That comes by spending as much time as possible knowing him. And how do we know God? First, we know God because we have the scriptures. And, and we talk about this so often around the church that, oh, the Bible and the scriptures and we have these truths. And, but if we don't really partake of it, then it doesn't do anything for us. It's like going to a buffet and talking about how great it looks, but never eating it. It doesn't do anybody any good. So we look at the scriptures and we talk about them and we kind of know some of them. We sat, a friend, we picked up a friend that lives around the corner from us the other day that, that uh, she always, usually needs a ride into Merritt Island. I was, we were not going to Merritt Island, but we decided we would take her just, just across the bridge there. And, and, uh, and she was saying, what do you think about all this you know, coronavirus and, and, and chaos and the whole thing? And then she said, the scriptures talk to us. About, about having our peace in him. She's like, do you know about Psalm 91? I said, you know what? Years ago, our family memorized Psalm 91 about the pestilence and about God's care over us in the midst of that. And so then she began to quote Psalm 91, all the verses. And as she was quoting them, and, I, and I, at one point I was like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. But the more she talked, the more I began to remember what those things say and what God is telling us. And in the midst of that, I, I was reminded, I don't need to... The, the chaos doesn't need to affect me on the inside. The chaos doesn't need to affect how I relate to people. The chaos is the chaos, but God is still God, and God cares for us and loves us, and he's created us to love us and, and uh, use us to touch other people's lives. So things like this become opportunity as opposed to um, chaos and, and problems in our lives. It becomes opportunity to serve others and, uh, and live for him. So, so we need to be so entangled with God, and we get entangled with God by spending time with him, by looking at the scriptures. How does God act? How does God react? What is he expecting of me? How should I act and react? When does he, when does he really work through people, and when does he push people aside? So I want to know those things so that I can know him, know what he's thinking, know what's on his heart, and serve him. We do that by prayer and Bible study, by being with others who do the same thing so that we can know him. Our goal, second part of this, how, how do we get this? The second part is our goal must be to do whatever we feel led to do when we're reasonably sure that it's God leading us. To do it. To do it. <laughs> so many things that God asks us to do in the scriptures even or is leading us to do like ministering to other people. We're like, oh, that can't be God. That's, that's not God. That's just... You know, that person doesn't want this or doesn't want that. We, I got a hundred excuses. The other night, I, I told you the other night, my friend and I went to the Merida Mall, and, and I found so many reasons in my head to say why I didn't need to go that night. But the truth is, I want to obey Jesus, and I want to tell others about him. 
because that's what he said to do. And so uh, I kept pushing, fighting those things back, fighting those things back. When, I get, when we got together, I told him that, and he's like, oh, I'm totally, that was totally my story, you know, that we're trying to find reasons why not to do what Jesus said to do. Yet we should be doing, we're reasonably sure that th- we should be doing, we should be praying for others, we should be seeking him, we should be seeking the way to help others and serve others. That's what Jesus said to do. Why would we not be doing it? So when we're reasonably sure of something specific that God wants us to do, we do it. And we find in the midst of that that he's empowering us to do those things. Some of the reason that we don't get this fire, this soul fire power is because we're not doing anything that needs it. Why would he give it to us if we didn't even need it? So he says, follow me, learn of me, follow me, go out and do what I've asked you to do. And in the midst of that, you'll find the power because the Holy Spirit's gonna come on you to do what I've asked you to do. So let's go out and whatever God's asking you to do today or tomorrow, the next day, in general or for specific, just do it and find him working, his Holy Spirit filling you to do that work. That's why I kind of started with knowing him by the scriptures and by others and by prayers because when we really know what he's asking us to do when we know his voice and we understand what he's asking us to do. He wouldn't ask us to do something outside of what he's told us not to do. You know, he's not going to do that. And some people say, why would he ask Abraham to kill his own son? Well, times were different then. They didn't even have the scriptures then. Right Now we have the scriptures, we know what is here and here and here, and he wouldn't ask us to go outside of that. Uh, he went through extreme measures to get people to, to test their faith and do those kind of things. And thank God we have that written down so we don't have to go through that. We need to follow after him. Be reasonably sure, do what he's asking us to do. One last thing is our entire lives must be in his hands. If we want this power of this Holy Spirit, the, the soul fire power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, our lives have to be in his hands. You have to be surrendered to him in every way. Surrender to God's will for your, for your lives. It's the hardest part, it seems, in following God. For we humans are pretty intent on getting our own way in almost everything. So we want God to do, to do, to do for us, but, uh, but we're gonna get what we want, and if what he wants is a little different from what we want, we'll probably pick what we want. And so surrendering of our hearts and our lives. So it's... So it's getting our minds entangled with God's. It's our, having a goal to be whatever he leads us to do that we do it, and then surrendering every part of our lives over to him. In, in, reading, in reading about the Holy Spirit and his activity among people, I came across this. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones was an was a evangelist. Uh, I think he died in 1981, but he was a great spiritual teacher and preacher. And he's retelling the story of this guy, Howell Harris, who was a leading preacher in the Welsh revivals in 1700s. This is what he talked about in his encounter with being filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, suddenly I felt my heart melting within me like wax before fire. Hear the the fire talk? Like wax before fire, his heart was melting. And the love to God for my Savior. I felt also not only love and peace, but a longing to die and to be with Christ. Then there came a cry into my soul within I had never known before. Abba, Father, which is, Abba is like the, a dear daddy kind of talk. It's, it's uh, like a, a close, intimate, da- like a child talking to their daddy. They call him daddy because it's an endearing term. Abba, Father, I could do nothing but call God my father. I knew that I was his child. Here, there's the being, remember that? I knew I was his child and that he loved me, that he was listening to me. My mind was satisfied and I cried out, now I am satisfied, give me strength and I will follow you. See, it's about being and then doing, going. He said, I will follow thee through water and fire. (laughs) It's amazing how that talk all goes together. I found this after, I was reading this after I had done all this other, this uh, through Acts 2 here. My desire for each of us, my desire for you and my desire for me is that we would have a maximum relationship with Jesus. I mean, everything that there is to have, this maximum kind of life with Jesus. I mean that we could have this life, that life is defined and guided and empowered by his Holy Spirit, where God not only meets the specific needs of our lives, but uses us on his mission as well to know the joy of ministering to others and them finding him 
and the joy for their lives in him. His mission is to draw all people to himself. And oh, how I desire to be a part of that. I know people who are like that. I know people who are, we might call them radicals, or, or we think, wow, I can never be like that person because they're, <coughs> excuse me, they're way out there. They're really serving God with everything they have. I've met people like that. And it, it's, not, it's not just some kind of theological fantasy as we read in the New Testament, the power of the Spirit in their lives and how they spoke and healed and ministered to people in all kinds of ways. It's not like some kind of theological fantasy that, that we talk about so often but rarely see. People are getting so close to God that they can begin to say the things he says and do the things that God does because he is doing it in them and he is doing it through them. Does that characterize your life? Do you, are we waking up and saying, God, what today? What now? I know you've got great things in store. What are we going to do today? I want to serve you, God. I want to see you work in me and through me. It can be that way. How do we get that? Again, we get entangled with the mind of God. We listen to him and follow him. And we say, use me in your kingdom. I'll do what you want me to do. That's how we do that. So th th that's the instructions, maybe even for this week for you. I want that to characterize my life, that the power of God is in here causing this soul fire inside of me, but also empowering me to be used. I might not speak another language for someone else to hear, but in the power of God, we could go out and minister peace and joy and help and health and wisdom and truth to other people around us. And they'll say, ah, a person of God has been my way, someone who's filled with his spirit. That's what I would like for people to be able to say about us. Let's pray for a moment. God, I don't want just some kind of cultural Christianity where I know how to say what you're supposed to say and go through the motions of what you're supposed to do. And you're kind of, you're kind of challenging us even in these days with that. We can't just go to church like we always have and talk with our friends like we always have uh, in the midst of this, this coronavirus problem. But God, any time, including right now, you want us to know you and be guided by your spirit and be surrendered to you. And in the process of that, your Holy Spirit will fill us to capacity and more, doing a work inside of us and using us to touch the lives of others. And God, we want that. We want that. And I pray for each one who's seeing this, that they would want it so bad that they'd be willing to seek you out with everything they have to get it. I pray that in Jesus' name. Actually, I pray too that each and every one who does that will find you working directly in their hearts and lives that they would see evidence of your spirit inside of them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. All right, so now at this place we would do some announcements, and so I want to do that. Um, we're, we're talking about our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We've been talking about that for a while. That actually starts next Sunday. Next Sunday, so I've been working on a whole list of verses for each day during those 21 days, and, uh, and I'll email them out or I'll put them on our website online under, under uh, prayer and fasting on the, on the main page so you can find it. And um, so you can kind of follow along, along during the week and be praying certain things, certain topics as you pray and fast. And prayer and fast, fasting is, you know, uh, if, uh, fasting can hold a number of connotations to it. And typically, typically in the foremost fashion of prast, uh, fasting in the Bible is, has to do with food. Uh, literally to fast. Like breakfast is the breaking of the fast from overnight. You don't, you don't eat overnight while you're asleep, at least most of us don't. And so fasting is to, is to keep from having food for a time and praying instead. Because if anything gets us focused, it's not eating. Uh, we, we focus on eating quite readily. It happens naturally. We don't have to think about it. But when we're not eating, we think about it all the time. And so um, that's the time to pray. And um, so we fast for a time so that we can pray. Now, I know some people can't fast because of medical reasons, so don't do that. Fast something else. 
And I've had people say, well, that's not a legitimate fast. Well, you know what? If you can't do it for medical reasons, you find something to do. So whether it's from social media or TV or radio or, or always holding your phone or whatever, uh, stop doing something for the purpose of seeking God instead during those 21 days. And this can be a fast from one meal or, or just from sweets and, and uh, sweets and treats sometimes is what people do or sweets and meats so that it's something uh, irregular for those 21 days. But with, withdraw from something uh, that you normally do so that you can pray and seek God instead. So that's the basis. That's the easy part of it. That's the, generally speaking, that's fasting. And so we're going to be fasting for God to do something in us and uh, something through us as a church and individually, uh, praying through those things. And so I'll have some guidance for you on that starting next week. Um, I did get news, uh, but between me actually writing this and getting ready to prepare it tonight, uh, or when I did it, when I recorded this, um, uh, I found out from City Fest that they have postponed it until next year, 2021. And so um, our getting ready and planning for that and all those are going to be put on hold until next year. So uh, the 29th, which would, have, which would be our, our outreach weekend, we were putting every, all of our eggs in that basket to work at City Fest and volunteer. That's not going to be happening, but of course, with everything else going on, uh, maybe not much is going to be happening. And so find a way to minister to somebody near you on one of those days, on the Saturday or the Sunday. Find a way to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Uh, I'll be back on that Sunday, and we'll, we'll talk then. You can communicate with us, um, especially during this service, uh, on a communication card, a digital one. So if you go to, if you're on our website, you can just look up, up at the top where it says contact. But if you're not on our website, if you're on Facebook, then you can go to launchpointnaz, all one word, launchpointnaz, backslash contact. And uh, there's a form on there you can fill out. You can put prayer requests in there. You can check some boxes that might be pertinent to you. Do that, and, um, and, and it'll come straight to me. I'll get it really quickly. And, uh, and we can work on helping you and, or praying for you, whatever we need to do. So do that. Uh, you can also give today online. We've, some of us do that digitally every week. And uh, again, if you're on our website, you go up to where it says give, and, and then when that page opens, just follow those prompts and click those buttons to give that way. If you're not on there because you're on Facebook, you can go to launchpointnaz.org slash give, and it'll take you right to that same page. Um, Look for the launch point briefing this week as things are changing all the time, as the details are developing about what we're doing about this coronavirus thing. And um, I, if you don't get that, but you want to get that, then go to that digital online card at launchpointnaz.org slash contact. And I think there's even a, a little checkoff thing you can check there to say, hey, I want to get the briefing so you can get those details because we want to make sure you get that. And so those are kind of announcements for the day. Uh, and we don't want to make a light thing of this. I mean, any, anyone dying for any reason is, is terrible, and, uh, and it grieves us. And uh, so we don't want to take it lightly. I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to go overboard either, and, and the world can make a bigger chaos than there needs to be. We need to be aware, right? Be careful. Those of you who might be more vulnerable to, to getting sick, be careful. Stay at home as much as you can. Wash your hands a lot. I mean, don't be a hermit. If you need to get out, get out and do what you need to do. But, uh, you know, as they say, we need to be washing our hands and, and just taking care of where we're at and who we're around and staying at six feet or so away from others. And, uh, or if you live with somebody who's vulnerable, you know, you need to be careful of them and where you go and what you do. So be careful that way. Um, we don't have to avoid each other, I don't think, if we're not sick. There's no known cases in Brevard County just yet. And so, uh, so we're okay to, to kind of mingle about. But just be aware when you're around other people what you're doing and how you're doing it. And again, this is a great time to be a blessing to someone else, to be a peacemaker, a peace bringer to those whose lives feel like they're in chaos and they don't know who to trust. Bring Jesus with you everywhere you go. Be filled with his spirit. Uh, John the Baptist, again, well, told his listeners that there was one coming who would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We know that to be Jesus. Live towards that. And pray for that filling of his spirit that's sent through Jesus to those who are following after him, who are, their lives are surrendered to him. So be surrendered. Seek him. Ask for him to fill you and to use you uh, every step of the way. All right? Be blessed.
and uh, we will talk again. Stay tuned on Facebook here and, and the briefing and uh, details will keep coming. And if you need anything, I want you to feel free to email me or call me. My, my information is the same information on our church webpage on the, on the contact page. All right, so be blessed. We'll see you again.